Good morning. This is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project, and this is December 4th, 2000. This morning we are pleased to have with us Robert Seavey. Good morning, Robert. May morning. we call you Bob? Or you may. That's may my we get usual very informal appellation. Um, to begin with, may I ask you how old you are? I'm 80. 80 years old, so you were born in the year 1920, Right. is that correct? Correct. And from the looks at you, you were born in May of 1920, right. is that correct? I know that because I just looked at your papers <laughs> a minute <laughs> you ago. You couldn't lose. What is your current address, Bob? In Weston. Weston, Massachusetts. Right. And your current marital status? Married. Do you have children? I have three daughters. How about grandchildren? I have one granddaughter, and that's all. Very good for you. Where were you born, Bob? In Bloomington, Indiana. Bloomington, Indiana. Um, tell us about that. Your folks were well, there. Well, I lived there all of three months. Oh, you did? <laughs> tell us about it. My father was a professor of law at Indiana University. And then, and then we moved to Lincoln, Nebraska, where he was dean of the law school. What about your mother? My mother was the daughter of a farmer in northern New York State, Seneca Falls, and had the rare privilege for a woman of her time to go to college, Syracuse. Did she really? That was unusual, wasn't yes. it? Yes. You, you went to Nebraska? Well, that's uh, when I was age three months, we went to Nebraska. And how long were you there? And we were there until 1927. So at the age of seven? Uh, we moved to Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. Again, the another uni college. University of Pennsylvania yeah. for one year. And then we moved to Arlington, Massachusetts. And about what year did you arrive in Massachusetts? In 1928. 1928, Herbert Hoover. Right, I remember seeing Herbert Hoover passing my school in a parade down Pleasant Street in Arlington. Is that right? Right. Was he campaigning or was he yes. president? Yes, he was campaigning. For yeah. his run against Franklin Roosevelt? Was no, he was running against Al Smith. This was 1928. Okay, that's, that's a very historic <laughs> marker. That's yes. very good. Your background then was uh, academic, uh, law, um, right. What, is your, what did your mom study in, in college? I couldn't tell you, but she became a school teacher mm -hmm. on Long Island somewhere. <laughs> um, All right, so you're in Massachusetts and you're pursuing your education. Um, you went to schools in Arlington? Arlington. I and graduated from Arlington High School. What year? Uh, 1937. In 1937, um, can you remember, was there an awareness um, in your classes among you and the guys you hung out with of events in Europe? Oh, very much, not among my associates, but my father was very much aware, in fact, was trying to get people to understand what was about to happen. And as early as 1935, he put aside all kinds of basic commodities because he knew there would be a war. And he had a, a group at Harvard Law School uh, trying to warn people of what would happen in the Pacific. Um, in the Pacific? Well, yes. So he well, was watching events in Japan and China as well? Right. Well, he had a special connection. His first teaching job was in China, and he spent five years in China uh, setting up a law school. He was hired by the Viceroy of Chile Province to do so. He had a three-year contract, um, and then he was Contract was renewed, and he stayed another two years. Where, where were you, or did you get uh, to go? I, I'm much later. <laughs> uh, he was, um, this was in 
1905 to 1910. Oh, I see. All right, I get it. <laughs> Long before my time. I get it. You were, you were anticipated, but <laughs> not online. Not even <laughs> anticipated. <laughs> okay, uh, but in your home in 1937, uh, there was a realization that something very much was so. impending in both Europe and Asia. Right. And your father took steps with others to see right. uh, what they could do about it. And personally, did he, he wrote a lot of letters uh, to people. And they had a group at Harvard Law School who that he organized to try to tell people what was happening. Was this a formal group? Or did yes. it have a name? Uh, I have. I don't recall it, but uh, yes, it had a name. And would he write to people such as uh, to President Roosevelt or yes. Cordell Hall or whoever people it might like have that, been? All over. That's very interesting. And how about you and the fellows in school? Did you anticipate uh, being involved? Well, of course, that was no. We didn't think much about that. Um, that was in 1937. Very much aware of events in Europe. We were very much aware, ultimately, of, of course, the invasion of Poland and things like that. That was 39. That was just two years later. And right. The American entered the war and four years later. So, right. So you were aware of it, but very not much. expecting to be called up or anything like no, that? No, no. Did you go on to college? I went to MIT. I was. Uh, senior at MIT on December 7th of 1941. Tell us about that day. Uh, where were you, what you heard, and where, how you felt okay, it would happen? I, well, I was at home. I was living at home. Yeah. I did, uh, and uh, we were in the living room that Sunday afternoon uh, and heard it on the radio and uh, didn't much care for it. Did you know where Pearl Harbor was? Oh, yes. You did? Yeah. That's almost unique in America. At that uh, time. Most people thought it was in the Philippines. Oh, well, that never occurred to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's, my father very carefully told me that's where it was, that oh. and no, something uh, had happened. Uh, I'd had, uh, even in my freshman year at MIT, we had an English teacher who was very mu was very much involved in foreign policy association, so we we were writing themes on this subject as early as 1938. Uh, so it was not new to me. All right, that this is very interesting that you were well prepared mentally, at oh, least yes. and academically, for what took place. December 7th, 1941, you're a senior at MIT. What was your status? Was there a draft at the time? Were, did you have a number? I don't think so. And I don't think there was, there was a, well, there must have been, because um, in order, as it turned out, I went to work in Detroit uh, in order to have deferment from the draft. From the draft, yeah. Uh, you had to have a full-time job. Let's yeah. finish your, your schooling then. Did you graduate from I MIT? graduated. They graduated us uh, in April rather than June in order to get us on the job as early as possible. Of 42. So, of 42. All right. So uh, you got a job. I went to work for Chrysler Corporation. I was one of two selected to go to the Chrysler Institute, which is a graduate school they operated um, for automotive engineers. I was in the automotive option of mechanical engineering at, at MIT, which includes aircraft engine design, as well as what we think of as automobiles. Tell us about the rest of, uh, if, if, as best as you can recall, the rest of your class and fellows and our women around you War had started, and then five months later, you're out of MIT. Hmm. You're all out in the world. Do you know what happened to others? Well, I know that some of them got called very soon. Uh, I bought a car from one who uh, 
1935 Ford from one who was called up. Um, and I used that to drive to Detroit. Um, but I don't know what happened. Well, most of them, I think, went into industry. I think very few of them were actually uh, called into military service. Because they very much felt that these people were needed to, to make the tools of war. Mm -hmm. And, excuse me. Was this under uh, terms of a deferment at that time? Um, I assume each of these were deferred, yeah. How about in your instance? I had a deferment. Okay. Um, were you operating? Well, not an educational deferment. There were no such things. This was um, a, a, a job to the war effort. Based on the thing. job. Yeah. Were you in this alone? That is, when you got in your car, your 35 Ford, and drove west, were you by yourself? Yes. Nobody else from MIT or any? Yes. One other classmate went to Chrysler. So he didn't, we didn't go together. We, he got there independently. Okay. Tell us about your job there. Well, uh, as part of the, the job had to be a full-time worthwhile job. It, although you were enrolled in Chrysler Institute, you went to classes in the evening after, after a full day's work. The, the classes were taught by department heads of the laboratories. So we worked in the engineering laboratories in Highland Park, Michigan. Um, the old Maxwell plant, interestingly enough. Really? <laughs> uh, and these were very plush laboratories that were used as a advertising gimmick. So everything was polished, red tile floors, uh, you couldn't, nothing could be dirty. Uh, it didn't look like uh, the usual uh, sort of thing that you would expect just people working uh, in, uh, in a shop. So uh, the big project at Chrysler was a very large aircraft engine, the XI-2220, which is a 16-cylinder inverted V uh, liquid-cooled engine. Um, and uh, my first job there was in the stress analysis laboratory run by a man who became very famous in that category, uh, Charlie Lipson, uh, doing uh, stress analysis of crankshafts and engine components. Uh, I developed a cylinder head thread for it uh, using photoelasticity. Uh, I got to uh, do, well, simple things like balancing uh, a crankshaft, uh, doing a stress survey around an oil hole of a crankshaft, things like that in that laboratory. This was part of the war effort then, this engine, oh, yes. I assumed, was going you know, to be There was no, no automobile business going on at all by this time. Automobile production stopped instantly when the was war... Was Chrysler making tanks at this time? Chrysler ran a, a, a tank plant. Mm -hmm. and in fact, in Detroit was what they called the Tank Automotive Center, which was the government's uh, end of the thing. and. Uh, Yes, I, I spent a day at the tank proving around and <laughs> riding around, uh, seeing what it was like. Uh, in uh, and one of the uh, things that Chrysler did to the the tank as it was designed originally used a seven cylinder radial aircraft engine as power. Well, an aircraft engine is designed for aircraft, and it does not have the low speed characteristics that an automobile engine has. And so uh, it was not a, it was a very difficult engine to drive in a tank because it would tend to stall when it was at low speeds. It was designed for maximum output at top speed. Um, and the transmission in the tank was a, I think it was a five-speed mechanical 
transmission. No, so, no reverse, right. <laughs> uh, and Chrysler said, they, we have a great idea. We have this manufacturing plant that makes Chrysler six-cylinder engines, and we'll combine five of them into one big monster uh, engine. This is the XI-2220 No, 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 now. this is a tank engine now. Uh, so they did. They, they had a, a, a common base, and they stuck five six-cylinder automobile engines around it. Uh, and geared them all together to a, a central shaft. And this engine uh, ran very nicely in a tank. It, was, it drove like an automobile. It had the flexibility of a, an automobile engine. Uh, but it had some problems. Uh, it, it had torsional vibration problems. And uh, they tried to solve those by putting torsional dampers, or I should say, pendulum dampers on the crank shafts. Uh, pendulum dampers were the things that saved the large aircraft radial engines, uh, made them work, made them survive. Um, that's a technical problem. <laughs> but in any event, uh, I got to balance one of these crank shafts with pendulum dampers on it, uh, called a bifiler suspension uh, anyway. I'm, I'm writing furiously. <laughs> you can see. You, right. I realize this probably is not much interest to most people. No, you'd be surprised how someday somebody's going to be thrilled to find your tape and say, so that's what they did out there. So please continue. Well, then I was moved to the electrical lab, worked for a very nice fellow by the name of Ed Webb. Uh, who took a great interest in the students. And uh, there I worked on all the electrical equipment that was being uh, built for tanks and trucks and uh, tested. We, had a, we built a, uh, a dust test uh, for t testing these components in very dusty conditions. Uh, and we had a um, cold room, which uh, tested things at 55 below Fahrenheit. Uh, you have to make sure the engines will start. At, at 55 below Fahrenheit, ordinary lead-acid battery doesn't put out anything. So uh, just because it's cold, so you have to have, in all these vehicles, you had to have heaters to heat the battery <laughs> to get the battery warm enough so that it would be able to put out enough power to crank the engine. How long did you do this kind of work now? I was there two years. The course was two years long. So you uh, were there until 44, is that correct? Right, June of 44. And did you continue to do work like this at this time? No, in June of 44, I acquired... No, I meant during, over the, oh, those two well, years. Oh, well, th the third thing that I did was in the aircraft engine design group where I did the de installation design work for putting this monster aircraft engine into a test bed, into an aircraft for flight. Uh, and they decided to put it into a P-47 airframe. P-47 had a twin-row radial. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a Thunderbolt. Um, P-47. P-47. Yeah. And, of course, this... A huge radial engine. That, huge radial uh, engine, yeah. but short. And here we are putting in a 16-cylinder, <laughs> eight cylinders long, uh, which sticks way out in front. And, and alters the center of gravity of the aircraft. So all that could be put into the tail of the aircraft was put into the tail. So that's where the radiators, the intercoolers, aftercoolers, engine oil coolers, turbo supercharger went to uh, balance the, the engine. And uh, the installation group's job was to design all of this equipment. What did this do for the weight of the plane? 
Uh, didn't I don't know whether it was that. heavier or lighter, but it, uh, the engine had more, somewhat more power. It was a, not a serious attempt at a, an aircraft that would be put into service, but as one to give it flight experience, flight test. Did these actually fly? And they did fly it. Uh, by then I was long gone. <laughs> Uh, it flew in 19, uh, I, sometime in 45, I think. They went down to, um, they sent a group of people. I don't know where they assembled the airplane, but I assume it was on the site, uh, to southwestern Indiana. And uh, they flew it there. I have pictures of it in flight. Um, and it broke a quill shaft in flight and was landed safely by a very skilled pilot. Quill shaft went from the reduction gear to the propeller shaft. It was the propeller shaft, actually. Um, so he landed with a dead engine? He landed with a dead engine. Oh, that's remarkable. Uh, I've done it too. <laughs> but it's, for him to do it was truly outstanding skill, I would say. Um, by that time I was in the Navy and elsewhere, but my classmates were present. Now that engine, the XI-2220, has appeared recently in the Smithsonian uh, Magazine, an article on very large aircraft engines, and uh, they... You were part of the scheme. I was part of that. Yeah. All right, it sounds as though you just said that you did leave uh, this job and went into the Navy. Tell us about that transition. Well, I knew I was graduating from this course in, in June, and I knew that uh, there were people being called, uh, not very many, but one could read the handwriting on the wall, and rather than wait until the um, inevitable happened, or could happen anyway. Um, there was, the Navy operated a recruiting office in Detroit where they were offering commissions to qualified people, mostly engineers. So I went down there and made application. Um, it's 44. In well, 44, yes. June of 44. It, well, it was probably a little earlier than that. But, but you signed up. But I signed up. Uh, I made application. <laughs> and then I told Chrysler, well, I'm going to get a commission, so you, you don't need to bother with my deferment. <laughs> and my commission and my draft notice came the same day. And the Could you have stayed at Chrysler because of the importance of your work? I presume so. Did you although, have to go to, into the military? Uh, most of my classmates stayed at Chrysler, but some didn't. I had one uh, good friend in my class who, well, I don't think any of them were drafted out of Chrysler. I think they all it took advanced efforts to get commissions or whatever beforehand. What were the um, conditions of your enlistment or going into the service uh, for the duration or for a specific number of years? I don't, it's a V-12, whatever that was. Uh, At the convenience of the president, I guess. I assume yeah. so. I have a commission signed by Forrestal, kind of interesting. Um, well, when my commission and my draft notice came on the same day, the Arlington Draft Board would not let me accept my commission because they wanted credit for one body, one more warm body against their quota. So my orders were canceled uh, and uh, I went home to be drafted. Uh, I was the, uh, I was put in charge of the draft, which is a group going from Arlington into Boston to go through the induction process. And we did. We, we all had a physical exam under the uh, draft procedure. Were you going to go in as an enlisted person at this? Well, 
I was an enlisted person for, an hour, a for a few minutes. Miffed about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, the happy thing. Well, well I'll, I'll I'll just tell you the, the next part. Um, then we were asked, Army or Navy? Well, I'll take the Navy. Uh, so we went into another room and had another physical exam by the Navy. And then we were shuffled into a small room where they started telling us uh, what it would be like going out to boot camp. And then a little door opened over in the corner. We got your commission out here. <laughs> ah. <laughs> So the mutiny was canceled. <laughs> <laughs> so I was an enlisted man for a few minutes and then went into this other room and they said, well, uh, uh, the uh, physical exam for uh, an enlisted man doesn't count for an officer, so you got to come back and have another exam. And the same people did the same exam over again. Did you feel, you've always felt that you worked your way up through the ranks? <laughs> Very rapidly. <laughs> and then, because I had no orders, I had a two-month vacation, July and August in, in New Hampshire. Wonderful. But I didn't know what was going to happen, and I had no income. So, ultimately, I got orders to go to indoctrination school at Plattsburgh, New York, which was an old army base, probably dating. Lake Champlain, yeah. Right, yeah. dating back to revolutionary times, some of the buildings. Uh, and if, uh, that was cultural shock. Um, and two months there, and then um, a gap, very small gap, maybe a week, and then I had orders to go to Advanced Doctrination School in Miami. This is in the fall of This was in the fall. Fall of 1944. 44. And finally, you're in safely into the Navy. Oh, I'm very much in the Navy. And they send you to Florida. They sent me to Florida for November and December. How about that? Where were you sent? Well, there was a Navy base in Miami, which was an advanced indoctrination school. I was fortunate. I had a car. I, I drove to Miami from Arlington, and at that location they had a, uh, for officers, they had the Flamingo Hotel. I don't know whether it still exists. It was a big pink building uh, filled with officers and their families, and if you had a, a children, you could live in the hotel and had one big dining room filled with children and, <laughs> and families. This is not your typical boot camp, is it? No. no. But although I was married, I didn't have any children, so we got to live in the servants' quarters if but we stayed you there. You used the word indoctrination center. Yes. Have you gone to boot camp any place? Never. Never? Never. No. No. What is an indoctrination center? Well, it's like boot camp, only for officers. Did you march around and shoot things? We and climbed ropes and we, we were learned about what a ship is. Uh, we even rode uh, uh, long boats. They had boats out on that the That came in very handy during your career, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, very useful. No, they were, it was partly a um, toughening up physical uh, program. And your wife say. was with you? No, no, she wasn't at, in the first indoctrination school at Plattsburgh. This was all men. No, at, at Miami. <laughs> but at Miami, I had my wife with me and uh, looked at the uh, bunk beds <laughs> and the facilities down at the end of the building and said, we think we'll go elsewhere. And we went out to the edge of town north of Miami and rented a, managed to find a very nice uh, motel. And uh, she got a job to help pay for it, uh, working for a, a retail shop in, in Miami. What was, your, uh, what was your rank at this time? I was an ensign. You were an ensign in training. Do you remember what they paid you? $150 a month. 
plus a family allowance of, I don't know, $30 or something. And in this indoctrination center, other than your learning to be an ensign, part of the United States Navy, were you headed toward a, a career path in the Navy? Uh, the only, uh, I was a line officer. I was not a special, I wasn't an engineering officer or anything like that. So you had the star on your sleeve? I had a star, it? right. And the last three days of that school was a trip on a destroyer escort down the Keys and back, and, and during which they fired their guns uh, at shore targets and got you used to loud noises. Thus starting a war with Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, no, they were all our, our property, so we didn't go down and shoot at Cuba. So you're learning a specialty now in the Navy? Uh, no specialty at that point. Okay. At the end of that school, they said, okay, now there are two options over to, open to you. Uh, you can go to landing craft school or salvage school. Salvage? And, salvage school. And it took being an engineer for a person of my age to get into salvage school. Well, I chose salvage school. Who would want to go to landing craft school? How did they describe salvage school? Did they try and sell you a particular interest, uh, landing craft and then salvage? I don't think they tried Did to that mean anything to you at the time as a term? Well, I knew what landing craft was, and, and I had a fair idea what salvage would be. In any event, uh, I, I chose salvage and... What was your definition of salvage for that time? Well, it's raising ships, uh, sunken ships, is what I thought of as, as salvage, and it was. Um, so the first two days, uh, we, we drove back to New York on New Year's Day and Sunday. And my wife will never forgive me, but we had no time to stop to eat anywhere along the way. There was nothing available on the way. Is this the first day of 1945? Yeah. Uh, some uh, friends at the motel gave us some food before we left. We drove that night. I got off at the destroyer escort, got my gasoline ration coupons and, and pay, <laughs> and we headed that night north because we had orders to be in New York on Sunday, actually. They didn't give us any time to get, him, get there. So when I got there, they said, why are you so late? <laughs> you ran out of gas, probably. Well, I t it took two days to drive from Miami to New York in the rain and fog and all the, all the rest. So you get out of the car, and you're in New York? Uh, in the evening. Yeah. What happened to your wife? She was with me. I mean, did, are you now on duty and going somewhere? Well, we were sent to the Henry Hudson Hotel for quarters. We spent the night there. That was the Navy would uh, put you up there for two or three days or maybe a week while you found a place to live in New York City, which was not easy. But there was a volunteer organization which helped you to find a place, and we did. We, we sure saw some awful places, but we lucked out. We found... Uh, a, uh, an apartment that we could share with a, a Christian scientist on 97th Street, uh, a very nice place, a doorman. Uh, East Side. And, and we, we were able to, we had her, I would assume, servant's uh, apartment, part of her uh, room, and we had kitchen privileges and uh, couldn't have been better. Where were you reporting to for duty? Where I was did you reporting go to day? Pier 88, which is where salvage school was. Okay. Now, you don't probably remember, but the Normandy burned and sank between Pier 88 and Pier 90. So you're on the west side? It's on the west side, yes, yeah. west 97th Street. Uh, and um, you could, uh, well, we had to do something with the car, rented a garage, 
for $15 a month. And for $3 more, you could have it brought to the front door every day. But we chose to save the $3. And I don't know that I drove, drove it to work or not. I, have, I don't think so. I don't remember how I got to Pier 88, but it wasn't a short distance. I imagine I used the subway and then walked across. Uh, but the salvage school had been set up in order to salvage the Normandy, which was lying on its side. The, when it caught fire, the New York Fire Department loaded it so full of water that it... They tipped it over. They tipped it over. Yeah. And so they had to get it out of there. It was being converted to be a troop ship. Um, and they finally got it right side up. Uh, towed it down the harbor, right? They towed it over to Brooklyn yeah. and cut it up. Very sad picture. Yeah, very sad. So were you part of the group of people trying to raise it or eventually? No, I, I came raise later. It? But you were uh, But they were used you? that that facility to train people. Okay. Tell us more what's involved in salvaging a ship. Well, uh, I'll tell you that I learned to dive deep sea diving the first two weeks of January in the Hudson River. Which as I recall that winter was coated with ice. Oh yes, you broke the ice and then you go down. Uh, I have pictures of uh, my classmate in, in diver's gear. They broke you up into groups of five, I this think. Just the it big was. copper helmet and the puffy suit. Oh, and, oh yes, and gloves. And they and lower everything. you down through the ice. Yeah, well. Tell us, sir, how that feels. It's not bad. It's nice and warm in the suit. The poor guys that are tending you, you take turns tending your classmate. You're handling these wet hoses with uh, woolen gloves, oh, wet great. woolen gloves. Great. You're standing on yeah. this icy surface uh, trying to tend him, listen to him. Uh, but if you're in the suit, uh, it's nice and warm. You, you go down and you sit on the bottom, wheel down in the mud and do your problem. They, uh, they give you a, a bag of pipe fittings, for instance, and you're supposed to go down there and screw them all together. Well, when you're five feet below the surface, it's totally dark because the Hudson River is so polluted. So everything you do is in total darkness. Did they, prior to putting you in this suit, run you through any kind of test uh, for claustrophobia? Uh, no. But they did put us in a pressure tank once, first. Um, to give you a feeling of what it like to be pressurized. And uh, I got a ruptured or a, a scar on my eardrum from, from that experience because I couldn't clear my ears. Um, and when I was in the suit, I had trouble clearing my ears and people thought I was afraid to go down. And I just told them, when I've cleared my ears, I'll go down. Uh, don't, don't worry, I'll go down. Uh, and you might think it would be claustrophobic, but I didn't find it, so. But it is total darkness. So you're sitting on the bottom of the Hudson River putting little gadgets together. Yeah, putting How did that relate to salvaging a ship? What they were, some of these people might have actually become salvage divers, but most of them were going to be ship's company on a salvage ship that had divers, that okay. had a salvage crew. And that's what I became. Uh, but they wanted you to know how difficult it was to work in a suit in total darkness and accomplish something. So this was... That's a good lesson. Yeah. Very good lesson. Yeah. Uh, one of the things we did, they had a, a, a workbench, a metal workbench and a vice suspended halfway down. And they sent you down with a piece of angle iron and you had a a hacksaw tied to your belt, and you went down and cut the cut the piece in two and brought brought back the two pieces. <laughs> and you were very careful not to saw your suit in half when you, you were sure didn't want to do that, and you didn't. You had to control your inflation, of course. You have what is called a chin valve that, uh, if you pulled on it, would stop the exhaust of air that's coming into you continuously. And if you pushed on it, it would 
uh, exhaust it more fully. So when you went down, you, you pushed on it and deflated, and when you wanted to come up, you pulled on it a little bit. You wanted to make darn sure you didn't pull on it too much or you'd come up and be spread-eagled on the surface. Which is very embarrassing. Very embarrassing. <laughs> it, I, ne I never saw it happen. How long did you do this? And this was January and February. Yeah, so you're two months in New York in the frozen Hudson River right. learning how to dive. And so what, to and, what tropical place did they send you? Well, they gave me a choice, again. Uh, quite remarkable, I think, all the choices I got. And uh, they said, do you want to go to Europe or do you want to go to the Pacific? And I said, I'll go to Europe. <laughs> and I, that's where they sent me. While you were there and uh, in this school and surrounded by Navy, how closely did you follow events in the war? Did you know what was going on in Europe and Asia at all the time? Pretty much, yeah. Although, you know, there wasn't an awful lot published. I mean, what we knew about was what was what the public knew about. Therefore, why did you choose Europe? Oh, I, I knew enough about Pacific. <laughs> I thought Europe would be a much nicer place to be. And it was. This is now, uh, we're almost up to March of 45. Are you shipped out of the country now forthwith? Uh, I, yep, yeah. I had orders to uh, go to Europe uh, and I went on the Queen Mary. I traveled alone along with 12,000 other people. And I think the logistics, the handling of my trip were just phenomenal because I got on in New York, uh, spent four days crossing the Atlantic. We went into north of Ireland, into Greenwich, Scotland. Greenwich? Greenwich. The old shipbuilding yards. Right. Yeah. And uh, anchored out in the, in the harbor. We didn't come up to a pier. And then lighters came out and started unloading us. We went ashore and there was a train waiting. And I got on the train and it traveled all day and all night to the south of England, to Portsmouth, I think it was. And when we got there, and I was traveling alone, I don't know who else was on the train, but I don't think the bulk of the people were from the ship. Nobody from your school was with you? No, you, you were no, alone. I traveled you, alone. Okay and arrived early in the morning in Portsmouth and there was a hotel where we could lie down for a while and, and uh, then have some breakfast. And a little later in the morning, uh, an LST, which is a landing ship tank, uh, pulled up at the pier. I climbed aboard and it took me and one other person some going somewhere. And it took me across the channel and directly to Cherbourg and tied up to my ship. And I hopped aboard. And your ship was? The ARS 36, the Swivel. And tell us again now, as, as you told me a little earlier, it's called the Swivel. Right. Why is it called the Swivel? Well, because all salvage ships were named for uh, salvage equipment, such as chain, link, hook, swivel, and any other, I don't know of any other names, but there, I'm sure there were. It was a subject to some uh, merriment. Uh, people thought it was a funny name. And we, the ship was at anchor in Cherbourg Harbor. And because it had the biggest anchor of any of the Navy ships, small ships in the area, it uh, used its anchor and other people rafted with us. We had a, a towing tug, an ATR-2, I think it was, auxiliary towing and rescue ship, uh, which was almost permanently attached to us. Um, but other small ships came in and our job was to make sure that no Navy ship got into trouble. People were always uh, 
dropping mooring lines and getting them wrapped around a propeller shaft. And when that happened, they called us and we'd send over our diving launch and a diver, he would go down and cut the line free. And we were there in standby status, just protecting the, looking after things. Tell us what Sherbrooke looked like at this time. It took a tremendous beating uh, it, during the, the you know, fight for it. What did it, it look like? It didn't look bad. It, it looked reasonable. As I, an operating harbor? It was yes, it was an operating harbor yeah. by this time. Were all the uh, piers and buildings around it smashed flat? There, uh, things did not seem terribly bad in Cherbourg. And in fact, I got to go ashore. I have pictures of the countryside. Um, and they, they operated, uh, the Army op uh, had built an airport there using these metal mats that you may have seen, and they flew DC-3s or C-47s. Could you travel up to look at the beaches at uh, Utah and uh, the Normandy uh, beaches? No, no, uh, we, we didn't. Uh, we got to go to Paris, but we didn't go to Normandy beaches. How about the, uh, the Channel Islands? The Channel Islands were still occupied by the Germans. They were. And the day before we, I arrived on my ship, they had put a shell through the bridge of a PC, which is the smallest Navy combat ship, killed everyone on the bridge. And the people on my ship, probably that would have been the ATR that went out to tow them in, they were very much worried that they would have to go out and tow the ship back. Um, but they didn't. They were lucky. Somebody else towed it back. You are on board now, a, a, a vessel of the United States Navy on active duty, and wh right. what were you assigned to do? Well, my very first job was commissary officer. I'm the junior ensign coming aboard, and uh, uh, you know what that is. I mean, you run the... You're the ensign pulver of the ship. Uh, yeah, yes. right. And health and welfare and stuff yeah. like that. Morale officer. Yeah. Right. Uh, and as I mentioned later, uh, as time progressed and people came and went, I became the executive officer, which is just below the commanding officer. But I never lost any of the jobs I had previously. How many men were uh, on you? There were about 65 normal crew uh, during the landings, and this ship participated in the landings. Uh, there were an equal number of visitors, you might say, living in the forward hold in, in hammocks, bunking in hammocks. And they participated in the landings and they bounced off of wrecks and things like that. Uh, they uh, were not happy with their limited armament, so uh, they managed to acquire some small anti-aircraft guns from wrecked ships and mounted them on on the swivel. At this point in time, was there a German Air Force active? No. Did you no. see anything like that? I, we were in no danger from anything of that sort. And what were you supposed to be doing? That is, uh, were you raising ships? Not in Cherbourg, because uh, there were no ships. There was no salvage operation going on there. We were just standby. But um, shortly, oh, at the end of the summer, <clears throat> Uh, we were sent to La Havre uh, to take, temporarily, uh, take the place uh, of an ATR, I think it was the ATR-3, which was t sent north on, uh, was going to be sent up into uh, Holland, the Netherlands, to do something. I, I don't know what it was. So we were sent to La Havre, which is a much bigger operation now. It's the principal port that was, through which all of the material for the war effort flowed into Europe um, up the Seine River. Well, the day that we arrived in La Havre, we found that the um, ATR-3 uh, had run over a wreck out in the, out in the outer harbor and had sprung a, a leak. And the captain, who was 
a member of my class, but a, a former chief, elevated to the rank of lieutenant, uh, remembered one thing from salvage school. If you go aground, make sure it's heavy. You don't, you don't want to go any farther aground. So uh, although he had many 10-inch pumps in addition to his ship's bilge pumps, he was so frightened by this leak that he ran it up on the beach. And there's a 28-foot tide in La Harve, and he ran it up on the beach at low tide and then let it sink. I mean, he just let the tide come in and overwhelm the ship. Although any one of these 10-inch pumps, as it turned out, would have kept him afloat. So this is what happened the day we arrived. And instead of just being a temporary assignment, it became a permanent assignment. And we ended up salvaging that ship. What was the name of the other one? The, the link or the spool? Uh, or? No, it was not a salvage ship. Okay. It was a towing. It was an ATR, which is an entirely different. Same size ship, steel hull, uh, whereas our ship was uh, a wooden hull, interestingly enough. Um, Yours was a wooden hull ship? Wooden hull. That's so you could also be a minesweeper? Th this ship was originally built, started by the American Merchant Marine uh, for commercial salvage work. And it had a, a very heavy wood hull, which is in some ways much harder to penetrate than a, than a steel hull uh, and bounces off of things very nicely, whereas steel tends to be penetrated. It's unforgiving, yeah. Um, it had, I don't, well, we'll go back and tell you about the ship if you'd like. It had uh, diesel electric drive. It had four Cooper Bessemer diesel engines, uh, and uh, which ran generators, which powered two electric propulsion motors. So it had two propellers, it had, but it had one rudder in between the two, which was a basic fault. Never put your rudder anywhere but behind the propeller. As a result, it was a very difficult ship to manage. And, and although the original captain, a reserve officer, a young man, was able to handle it without any difficulty at all, his successor, who was used to a, an ATR type of ship, which is a triple expansion steam engine with one big propeller and one big rudder, and very maneuverable, uh, he never learned how to handle our ship. That could be a, a severe detriment. It was. When you sailed from um, Cherbourg over to La Harve, <clears throat> you crossed all the famous the, beaches that right, we know of. Right, right. We were out to sea is, beyond them. Is there anything you can remember having seen there that uh, told you history had been made here? Not a thing. You were too far we were out far to enough see. out, so we didn't. See, I don't recall seeing anything. What about La Harve itself? What did that? Well, La Harve, of course, all the the waterfront area was totally des devastated. We bombed it into absolute nothing. Uh, partly because, well, largely because there were e-boat pens there. These are mm -hmm. fast motor torpedo boats, and we ended up uh, mooring or tying up right next to the remains of those e-boat pens. But they had nine foot thick concrete, reinforced concrete roofs, but they were, they were demolished. And the remains of e-boats were in the water. You could f find them at low tide. But the whole waterfront area of La Harve was pulverized. And so when this happened, there were, there were ships tied up alongside of concrete piers that had buildings on top of them, and then on top of the buildings were uh, cranes that were used for unloading ships. All of this ended up on top of the ships, reinforced concrete, sank the ships, and just this in horrible mess of reinforcing steel and concrete that we had, the Army had the job of, of cleaning up, and we helped the Army when we had, when they wanted us to. Give us an example of 
how you put your all your training into use. You're there on a ship, a salvage ship. Uh, you're almost running out of war uh, here. Yeah, I uh, I don't think I my salvage information experience did anything much to help. We had a salvage. Did, did crew. you ever raise a ship? The, our ship did. The salvage. We had a salvage crew aboard, which had two officers, and two chiefs, and and uh, two or three people enlisted men below them, and I never, I never dove again, because I was ship's company. And they, so all that time in the Hudson River was, <laughs> was for nothing. I never had any practical use of, other than knowing what the, you know, what they were up against. Um, we. No, we, we <laughs> never really utilized it. But I think it was the right thing to do, to put ship's company through uh, this course. Oh, absolutely. You were prepared for whatever you We were prepared. You, oh, we had us, things yeah. other than salvaging. We were sent out. For instance, the Seine River was the sole, uh, at this point, or now, I guess, primary route for material going up into Europe. So the, the Seine River had to be kept open and the outer harbor had to be kept open at all costs. So one of the first things that we had to do was to go over and make sure that a ship that had gone aground on the edge of the channel stayed there. So we went over and cut holes in the hull to make sure that it wouldn't float into the channel. Now that's not salvage work, but uh, just the opposite of it. But it's your say. engineering career, looking at the thing like yeah. that. Did and you then, run into the Germans at all? Any prisoners, no. or oh, were yes. they working around the? Port? Yes, the prisoners were working in the waterfront area all the time, and trying to clean it up so you guys could invade their their <laughs> homeland. Well, they had no that's, choice. Yeah, and uh, they. Uh, scavenged our garbage pails. So they probably found our garbage pail more attractive than some of the food they were eating. Uh, we, we were in La Harve, we were very fortunate. We ended up with a six by six truck, uh, which was used to, to take the crew into town every evening. There was an enlisted men's club in La Havre, and half of the crew had leave every night and uh, went ashore and enjoyed life at the enlisted men's club and came home and pushed each other up the gangway as they were inebriated. Uh, and we used that truck on one occasion to, to go down and see the uh, invasion area. We, we used the truck to go to uh, Mont Saint Michel, which mm. is in that beyond that area, we went through Saint Lo and Cannes, and those devastated places. Uh, and one of them, we we didn't know what to do. We came to it, and the whole street was paved with flowers arranged in a pattern, and we had to drive over them. There was no other route. There was nobody around to tell us otherwise. And I don't think we damaged it any. We must have crushed a few flowers, but it was uh, felt very uncomfortable in doing it. Was this some sort of memorial? To, you I know? assume it was something the French had done. Can you tell us of any other um, recollections of the war that you had passed through, that it, it was all around you and it much history had been written in the area you were in. Can oh, you remember yes. other things you can tell us about that you saw? Well, I, in the harbor you could see the liner Paris lying on its side, uh, but that had sort of been earlier than the war, I think, or early in the war. Uh, there was a big uh, dry dock full of sunken ships. Uh, at low tide, we just missed it when we came in the first time was a sunken floating dry dock, which would have been very bad if we'd run afoul of it. Uh, the whole waterfront area was uh, just 
rubble. Uh, ultimately, I uh, got an opportunity to go to Paris with salvage officer, managed to somehow acquire a Jeep, and uh, we drove to Paris, uh, and their Navy operated a hotel there, and we got to stay in the Navy hotel. Um, and uh, so I got to see the countryside. I had very little contact with the local people. Um, we got all of our food from the uh, army. So our coffee came in 24 pound bread sacks, all ground and ready to <laughs> brew. Uh, uh, the uh, base, the Navy base, operated a pastry shop and uh, fantastically we got shipments of pastries on a fairly regular basis as part of our work uh, compensation I guess you'd say absolutely <laughs> about uh, this is it must be very close to the end of the war we might even have passed by oh, here but, oh yes uh, are we up to May of 1945 here? I, we, we were, I think I was in, still in Cherbourg when VE Day occurred. Can you tell us about that, uh, the word comes that it's over? I have no recollection of just what happened there. Um, I'm, certainly people were very happy. Did you feel then, uh, did you, your thoughts turn to home as as they say, did you feel you're going to get out of this and go home? Oh, I, I had no question but I would survive and, and ultimately get home. How long did it take you? Uh, well, I came home some? in, in uh, March of 46. We were about the last people to leave because that was our job, was to make sure that the, uh, all the ships that were coming to carry the troops back to the United States had no trouble, things ran smoothly. So the, the port of La Harve would function smoothly, and it did. We, we repaired a Navy ship that was damaged in the North Atlantic storm. Uh, we undid the mooring lines from many propeller shafts and made sure that these long lines of troops got aboard and they were going home. And they were all going then home. Then it was your turn. And when everybody had gone, we got to go home. <laughs> <laughs> they gave you the padlock and said, put it right. on the door. And uh, most of the enlisted men were the original people who had gone across the Atlantic two years earlier uh, and participated in the landings. So, uh, but some of the officers had been rotated for rest and recreation and welfare and sent to the Pacific. That's what happened to the original captain. And uh, he was replaced by a man who was far less competent, far older. He was about 60 years old, had been an alcoholic all his life, and uh, there lie many other stories. And how about you now? How did you get home? Did I came home on my ship. On your ship? Yeah. They didn't send the Queen Mary for you? No, yeah. they didn't send the Queen Mary. They, uh, when the time came, they took us and the one remaining surviving ATR towing ship and two LSTs, one of them loaded with German trucks and vehicles and that kind of thing, and the other one loaded with German ammunition and all kinds of explosive materials. And these were LSTs that had been in the British Navy, were in very poor condition, broken ribs, all, you know, worn out. They loaded them up with that stuff, and we were all supposed to go back together. Uh, we'd had no repairs from the time the ship was built, uh, and we were supposed to go back and help each other get back. <laughs> you we sailed off as a convoy? And we went off as a group of four. Where were you headed? And we went originally to 
England, and then from there to the Azores, from the Azores to Bermuda, and, uh, and originally intended to go to uh, Norfolk, which is Navy base. And when we got just outside of Norfolk, my ship got orders, go to Boston. <laughs> which made sense because most of the crew came from the Boston area. And uh, my wife was actually almost on her way to Norfolk to meet us, uh, canceled her plans. And uh, we sailed up the East Coast uh, through the Cape Cod Canal at dawn and tied up in Charlestown. I got off and went home on the subway. Met my wife in Harvard Square. Home is the sailor. <laughs> so you're home in the March or April of 1946. It was my parents' home. Yeah. In Arlington. Arlington. And three days after we arrived, I was out of the Navy. Discharged that quickly. Right away. At what rank? Uh, I was a JG by that you're time. You're a JG. And what, what decorations did you have? What oh, just the European Theater ribbon. European Theater of Operations. And, right. Um, in, in the time you were in the service, was there a, one experience that stands out above others that you think okay. about every once in a while? The trip home. <laughs> the trip home on your ship that you're... It was the most dangerous, awful experience I've ever had. Uh, I, I should confess, I'm a chronic seasick, and uh, the trip home was in the spring, and the North Atlantic in the spring it is not a, a good place. Dangerous to place. That's why we went to the Azores and across. They wouldn't allow a small ship to go across the North Atlantic, but you have to get from England to the Azores, and that was an incredibly rough period, during which. Um, the LSTs had problems. They were, they were always running at flank speed on one of their engines and repairing the other one. So we were almost never going more than six knots. That was their top speed, flank speed in one engine. Um, and, and they were typically passing parts to us to be repaired. We had the only repair facilities. And the ATR had really had the only practical towing capability. Well, we never towed each other, thank goodness. But at one point, um, the ATR, which is a triple expansion steam engine with a condenser connected by a big flexible metal bellows, ruptured that bellows and lost its vacuum, reducing its top speed to six knots. And it had to be repaired because otherwise they'd lose their operating fluid, which is fresh water. Uh, so they had to unbolt that thing. And in the midst of these mountainous seas, managed to pass it to us to be welded and passed back to them, put them back into operation. But as a result, it took us almost a month to cross the Atlantic oh. with one day in the Azores, where we got some fresh food, and one day in Bermuda, where the, we made the first entrance to the harbor, the inner harbor at night that anybody had ever attempted because the captain couldn't wait to get to the officers' club for a drink. <laughs> <laughs> the two LSDs were smart enough to stay outside and wait until daylight. We went in, the ATR was in the lead. He bounced off the side of the channel at one point and got all excited on the radio and blowing his whistle. <laughs> but we made it into the harbor. And to your tied. knowledge, did the other ships make it home? The other two ships? Yeah. Yes, they did. Uh, one of the ATRs that had the explosives on board actually in the Azores went down and welded their broken ribs. They said, you know, if we don't do this, we're going to sink. So we may blow the place up, but we're going to weld those broken ribs. 
And, and the other one with the trucks and cars and everything, that made it too? That made it too. We yeah. all arrived just outside of Norfolk as a group. And then we And then you off. took off to Boston. Right. You know, I dreamt about such a thing, but I never thought it would really happen. <laughs> <laughs> kind How of about, amazing. How uh, about your experience, you remember coming home. What about a character, a memorable character of your time in the Navy? Well, I, I, I think the captain was the most memorable character. The 60-year-old captain? Uh, yes. Uh, he became Captain Quig and they wrote a book about him? Almost. Yeah. Uh, the crew didn't like him. I, I became about the only person on the ship he could trust. And I don't know why, but <laughs> I, I didn't give him a, you know, people would talk about him all the time. Um, and he, they didn't like what he did, but on the other hand, uh, he didn't have the strength to r resist them in a sense. Um, he, he was not good at enforcing discipline, um, which is not good. He, well, he just didn't have a good record. But the, the, I have to tell you a story about his first arrival. Uh, I think it was either the first or second day after he came aboard, he decided to go ashore with one of the chiefs. Uh, and they ran around the bars and got drunk. And they broke in onto a, a party given by the commander of the naval base for the mayor of Cherbourg and made big nuisances of themselves. <laughs> and his relief, his replacement was coming on the way the next day. But he had a good friend in a very high place, Comserve Lent, who managed to kill that. And his replacement came, but became the executive officer. Well, his executive officer was another of the same. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. All right, I've asked you <laughs> about a memorable character. <laughs> They're all. Uh, incredible experience. Did you join a reserve unit when you came? Yes, home? I did. The, uh, uh, our family physician in Taunton, which is where we ended up in 1949. I spent three years at Ford and then came to Taunton, Massachusetts, where I worked for a company that no longer exists, Paragon Gearworks. And our family physician Incidentally, it cost $3 to visit a physician at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, was a former Navy doctor, and, and so he talked me into joining the reserves. I did not join any veterans organizations. Okay, that was uh, my next question. The war is over. What did you feel about coming home? Did you, uh, were you delighted it was all over? Or sure did you was. Have feelings that once in a while the, that wasn't bad and it was a Big adventure? Oh, it was a big adventure, no question about it. I, I have to tell you, uh, one more Navy experience was uh, in the spring of 46. Um, the uh, ship, uh, war's all over. They're sending troops for re recreational activities while they're waiting to be sent home. And the ship was allocated one person who could go to Switzerland for a week for $40. And nobody wanted to go except for me. <laughs> so I got to go. You I, wanted to check out the Swiss Navy? I, the, yeah. I thought Switzerland would be a great place to go. <laughs> and I drove to Switzerland in a French Ford with an army colonel who also was going there. And I got four days of skiing at Zermatt and stayed in their top level hotel and it was fabulous. And I have, a, there's a memorial book that they put out of, of this leave program full of pictures and things. I took a lot of pictures in Zermatt. Good for you, good for you. And we met up to Gornograt the last day of skiing. I guess it was only three days. The last day of skiing, I, only, two, only two of us had ever skied before. We, we hired a ski instructor for 50 cents for the afternoon. 
the others were uh, taught in, in a group. And then this third day, we, they took us up this cog railroad to the Gonagrat. And we spent the whole day skiing down. You, you got your 50 cents worth, didn't you? Sure got your yeah. money's worth. When you came home, did you discuss with your wife or your family or friends uh, what your career had been like, what you had done in the Navy? Oh, I'm sure I told them all about what, where I'd been and you what I did. You talked about it and your adventures oh, and the 60-year-old yes. captain who oh, disgraced yes. himself Well, I'd been party. writing home about yeah. it, too, although it went through the censor. I guess I was careful with what I said. How important to you was serving in the military? Oh, I, I, it was important. In uh, what way? I felt it was something you probably had to do, uh, although I really didn't intend to go to Europe. <laughs> I really thought I was going to the Naval Ordnance Laboratory, I will confess. I, I, uh, I would not have been happy to be in combat. I don't think I don't know how good a combat person I would be. Although I managed to, you know, diving in the Hudson River in a hard hat is a form of combat, I guess. Absolutely. Do you feel serving in the military affected your life, other than disrupting it for three or four That's years? That's about all. It was an interesting, very interesting experience. Uh, one, would, one would just as soon do it without, but um, I can't say it was bad. Let's see if, if I can ask this correctly. What, what did you think then of the war you were involved in? The Oh, I the thought it was a... It? And, and what do you think now? Has your position changed at all? Not at all. I think we had no choice but to do what we did. The world would be an entirely different place. And. Uh, I, I can't, it's, it's horrible to imagine what it would be like if we had not prevailed. And, it, you know, we didn't win it by a big margin. We, it was nip and tuck at many points along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we should have been involved earlier. Uh, that was my father's point of view. My father was a veteran of World War I. His father was a Civil War veteran. And uh, I even have a, an antecedent who was uh, a minute man, so. You have quite a military family, don't you? Yeah. In a sense. Do you feel there's a difference, or there was a difference, in public opinion uh, regarding veterans who served in your war, uh, the Korean War, and oh, the yeah. Vietnamese War? There certainly was an enormous difference. Uh, you know, in, in what what Korean, distinctions did uh, you see? And Vietnam veterans were abused. I mean, they, they had, for the most part, were volunteers, had the highest of motives. And uh, I think they were terribly undermined by uh, people here. I, I think we lost the Vietnam War. We didn't lose it, we won it. But then we didn't follow up. We didn't support the Vietnamese after we left. I, attribute that to Senator Church primarily. Frank Church? Yeah. They guaranteed that there would be no help for the South Vietnamese government. So it collapsed. It was overrun by the communists. We, things would be quite different if we had helped them. One, we wouldn't have many, as many Vietnamese people living here as we do. I have no objection to their being here, but I think they would have been happier in their own country under better conditions. We wouldn't have had the boat people. No, I, th I think we failed them. Your, your views are not those of Robert McNamara. Not at all. Who was the, the one of the authors of Oh, he was the war. one who mismanaged the war, yeah. Do you feel it was a failure of management rather yes. than yes. will? Yeah. Well, we were always wa waging a defensive war. All of the big battles came as a result of North Vietnamese assaults. And all we did was react. Uh, I think the war could have been f fought far more effectively. Have you 
taken advantage of or received um, any um, benefits as a result of being a veteran? Did you uh, um, go back to school again or I took one, one or course, uh, night course, I guess it was, in uh, economics or book uh, uh, economics, I guess it was. And I did it, uh, I had uh, a lower interest rate loan from a bank for a house that we Oh, a, a veteran's mortgage, 4% mortgage. Four, yeah. yeah, which was certainly an advantage. Very helpful. Yes, yeah. indeed. Is there uh, one thought or one incident that we haven't covered here this morning, overarching everything else, that is something you'd like to say to people 50 years down the road? Uh, I had that thought earlier, and I, I don't have it now, but it was a certainly a remarkable experience and a and a terrible time, and I'm sure glad it turned out the way it did. I, I just shudder to think of the alternative. Mm -hmm. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you would like to uh, make no, part I, of this record? I think you've done a pretty good job of covering it. Oh, I could go on for hours, I'm sure. No, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's what you want. Okay. Thanks for coming in today. Good it enough. It's been very nice. Appreciate it. Thank you. It.